All right, thank you everyone for joining us for this amazing kickoff to the Web3 and Society Interintellect series. Uh, today, we're talking about old governance and new governance with the amazing Kyla Scanlon and Jonathan Hillis. So with this series, we are hoping to create like a thoughtful, accessible, and fun forum for anyone who's interested in how this new Web3 technology intersects with all aspects of our lives from civic participation to the financial system, to culture, science, and even private relationships. And it's okay if you've just heard about Web3 for the first time, or if you're totally skeptical or super enthusiastic, we're just here to learn together. Um, and today we've got two amazing special guests. We've got Kyla Scanlon, who is a very popular financial commentator and educator, and she's best known for her timely, insightful, and playful analyses on the economy and markets and everyday life. Um, John Hillis is the founder of Cabin and the former director of product at Instacart. And with Cabin, he's building something incredible and ambitious. Um, it's a hybrid network city for online creators with distributed physical hubs. They have three neighborhoods now, starting in Texas and now expanding to California. So thank you both for joining and welcome. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll get right to it. Our governance is a vast topic and it affects communities, corporations, countries, and we could easily spend hundreds of hours on any of these threads. But globally, it seems that we seem to be seeing like a crisis in the trust in governance, and perhaps this is amplified by easier and quicker access to information. So Kyla, we'd love to hear a bit about what you think is happening and why it's timely to start talking about and discussing um, alternative models of governance and coordination. Yeah, so just what's happening in the world at large or any just in general, I guess. Yeah, anything yeah. that you find interesting and want to share with the audience. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think like a lot of governments are going through almost a crisis of confidence. Like people still trust what's going on. They still think that things are happening, but it's also like, why are things happening the way that they are? Um, so I think you're seeing that, like I sit on the econ side of everything. So like fiscal and monetary policy, monetary policy, especially um, you're sort of not sure what's going to happen. I think a good example of a crisis in governance is what happened in the United Kingdom. You know, they released this mini budget several weeks ago, and obviously markets did not like that. So markets were able to dictate ultimately what was effective policy, and now, you know, trust is out of office. So I think like you're just starting to see people begin to question the quote unquote traditional models and model or markets being, you know, the final judge and a lot of that. So it's sort of interesting, like, it, you know, what what exactly is our model of governance right now? Is it market dictated? Is the Federal Reserve being overly swayed by markets? Like there's so many questions that, that come with that, yeah. Yeah, so we'd love to hear a bit about how you think like Web3 might complement some of this or like how can we think about alternatives um, using like a Web3 framework? Yeah, I mean, I, so I've given several presentations that like I think this will go mm -hmm. into the concept of DAOs, uh, you know, DAOs are sort of taking away that centralized entity and saying, okay, everybody should have an equal say, everybody should have an equal stake, which is also really important, like giving people actually ownership over whatever they're a part of. Um, so I think that sort of model is, is interesting, but I also think like there has to be more people driven stuff and that, that the coordination aspect of that is, is difficult. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, for anyone who's like new to uh, Web3 or DAOs, um, um, Kyla, could you tell us a little bit more about like what a DAO is? And um, you've given several presentations on this and like what is so powerful and compelling about DAOs? Yeah, so the DAO is a decentralized autonomous organization. And the way I describe it, maybe John has thoughts on this, um, I describe it as an LLC on the blockchain. Uh, basically, you have a token and that token represents ownership in that DAO. And if the DAO is like, we want to buy a certain type of art piece, we want to do a certain type of thing, you're able to vote on whether or not that'll go through with your token. So instead of having, you know, like I always say five guys in a boardroom in suits deciding everything, it's more so community driven decision making um, and also incentivized monetarily through their tokens. Yeah. yeah I, I can hop in there. Um, so also spent a lot of time thinking about DAOs and, and I think um, one of the things that tends to be perplexing for people about them is that they they don't have clear or simple definitions because they they mean many different things to many different people. Um, so I think that Kyla's definition is is a very good like 
you know, sort of um, base definition to start with that that um, creates like a skeuomorphic comparison to previous systems for for coordinating humans like LLCs. Um, but there are some really interesting uh, primitive components of of on chain governance that create systems that are different and not possible um, via structures like LLCs and also not possible via sort of uh, previous internet-based coordination mechanisms. Um, so, so, you know, one way to think about that is that um, we've spent the past couple of decades forming communities like the II or like subreddits or whatever. Um, and those tend to be made up of people from all over the world who could be, you know, pseudonymous, um, could be anywhere in the world, um, you know, and they've been able, we, we've been able to communicate and to exchange information, um, but we haven't actually been able to like coordinate resources effectively. Um, and what, what I think DAOs are really good for is adding that sort of um, tangible coordination layer of real assets to what has developed as like successful online communities over the past couple of decades. And it really up levels the um, capabilities of those communities, because now instead of just like talking about ideas, you can actually um, put resources together in a trustless way that allows everybody to participate in the execution of decisions with real financial impact behind them. And we're seeing that with Kevin. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, my name is John. Uh, I work on a, a DAO called Cabin. Um, we're building a, a network city. Um, and so, you know, our belief is that uh, the sort of core primitives that, that blockchains allow for a lot of innovation on are culture, economy, and, and governance. Um, and if you think about those three primitives, that's really what makes a city a great city. Um, and, you know, for the past century, those uh, like cities tend to be designed around the dominant technologies of, of an era for the past century. That's been cars primarily. You know, we, we believe that um, cities in the next century are going to be built around the internet and around blockchains. And you can start to think about what it looks like to have those shared layers of culture, economy, and governance, um, but not geographically bound to a single location. And so the idea of a network city is that you can take those those things, um, represent them online and on chain, and have different physical hubs all over the world that have shared culture, economy, and governance. Uh, John or, or Kyla, can you um, can you talk a bit about uh, why uh, one would want to use a traditional LLC structure like versus a DAO? Like, what are the advantages here of of actually doing something uh, in a decentralized way? Yeah, so so I think an important thing to note here is that um, these are not mutually exclusive structures. And actually, Cabin is an interesting example of this, where um, you know we 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 think of the DAO as a constellation of other on chain and legal structures. It's a network. Um, and so the um, and that the, the network is governed by a shared token. Um, but our our DAO, for instance, is legally structured as a UNA, an unincorporated nonprofit association, that is made up of multi-signature on-chain wallets and LLCs that represent you know um, independent properties in the network. And so um, I think it, it's people get a little bit caught maybe on thinking in the traditional monolithic centralized terms, um, even within their framework of, of thinking about DAOs, when in fact, most of the successful DAOs right now, and most of the successful governance experiments are actually about decentralizing into autonomous pods that can be represented as, um, you know, on-chain or legal entities that form networks. And do you, do you think that this kind of a hybrid mo model, right, where you, you you have both DAOs and LLCs that are uh, interoperating with each other, is this is this like primarily the way of the future? Though of course it's it's possible to have something that's entirely on on the blockchain. Yeah, curious to hear, uh, you know, Kyla's take and and other people's takes. But yes, I think uh, my my sense is that these sort of constellation DAOs, like the real problem we're solving for here is that um, governance mechanisms were primarily designed for large scale nation state sovereigns. Um, you know, if you, you look back at like 
um, you know, Hobbes and, and Rousseau as sort of like the, the pillars of, of modern political theory, um, they were trying to transition from a world governed by kings into a world governed by nation states. And as part of that transition, they necessarily had to design within the sort of pre-existing conditions of these very large polities, um, these, you know, bodies of, of millions of people. And you take a very different approach to governance design within the context of multi-million person polities than you do within the context of, you know, five to 10 person small autonomous pods. Um, and so I think the big unlock with, with DAOs is not um, just the sort of cooperative form of, um, you know, greater distribution of, of democratic power within an organization, but is actually the ability to get people into very small groups and practice a, a localized form of collective action governance um, that I think has been best explored um, in the academic literature by Eleanor Ostrom. We love Eleanor Ostrom. <laughs> we can talk don't, more. Don't about build a company without like being very close to to it. In in Interinsect's case, it's uh, technicians of the sacred and Ostrom next to each other. Nice. Best best uh, kind of ointment for startup. Yeah, and Kyla uh, would also. You know. <laughs> yeah, and Kyla, I know I know John also uh, mentioned this. We'd love to hear if you have any thoughts on this as well. Yeah, sure. So I think I come from it, like, I'm not obviously like boots on the ground building a DAO like John. So like, for me, a lot of the, what, what I'm sort of paying attention to in my lane is regulation. So in terms of like how DAOs are going to proceed, I think that regulation could sort of destroy any, a lot of progress that's being made there, um, specifically here in the United States, right? So I mm -hmm. think like the idea of having a DAO and like having collective governance and having people, because every, like, um, this is a great example where people are really looking for a community online. And I think DAOs really um, enhance that and allow people to engage online in a whole new way. Um, and even beyond online, build companies in a whole new way. And I think that's super important, but there's like this new, ways of thinking um, and old ways of regulating sort of thing. And that's not the right way to say it, but I think that sort of thing is, is something to watch out for um, because they could sort of like put everything back in a box, especially here just in the United States. I know it's a global conversation, but um, yeah, like the structure is great, but I think it'll it, like Wyoming allows DAOs to be treated similarly to LLCs, uh, but mm -hmm. the, the regulatory barrier I think is uh, could prevent a lot of people who would have a DAO from, from building a DAO, yeah. So are you seeing other examples of regulation pop up around the United States and other countries, or are you seeing things that are currently in the works, or is this more of something that we're expecting might happen and thus circumvent progress? Yeah, well, I'm sure John like, knows a little bit more intimately what that looks like, but it's a, it's a nightmare, uh, especially here in the United States. Like SBF has been uh, on the ground trying to figure it out and people are dismissive or like not happy about that because it's like, well, you know, you're sort of designing, he's going after the DeFi, C5 model and saying like, oh, we want it to be a little bit more C5, KYC, all this stuff. Um, so the issue with the, the path of regulation right now is that they're potentially going to treat these tokens, and maybe John can weigh in here if I'm not 100% right, but they're going to treat these tokens as securities. And so if you begin to have that sort of model, like that's going to change the whole autonomous aspect of it, the whole decentralized aspect of it. So um, I think regulation is, is sort of trending in the right direction, but there's a lot of uh, old ways of thinking being applied to this new model that deserves so much more than it's being treated as. In the EU, they've said DeFi, which is decentralized finance, they're like, this should not be treated like traditional finance. Like we have to have a whole new thing for this. But here in the United States, um, there's a lot of resistance to thinking about it um, in an innovative way, yeah. Can you can you describe some of the, um, uh, the, the issues of the thinking behind treating DAOs and tokens as uh, securities versus, I don't know, something else? Yeah, well, I mean, the other thing would be potentially commodities, you know, which would also be a weird form of, of regulation. Um, maybe John can expand on that too. But like, you know, the, the way that they see tokens is value goes up over time. So it's something that has to be regulated similar to security. So it has to go through the SEC here in the United States, which is the Securities Exchange Commission. And if something gets regulated as a security, you have to have that much more information. There's that much more data gathering that has to happen on the constituents that are part of the DAO or part of whatever 
or um, is being regulated as a security. So that creates a whole, um, just a lot of barriers and sort of goes against the whole ethos of the space of decentralization, of making sure that people can be anonymous um, and protected data wise, yeah. Yeah, I think what's happening in crypto right now is just sort of a classic example of the like red queen paradigm of regulation, um, which I think is an Alice in Wonderland reference. But it's basically this idea that, um, you know, any any new technology is inherently going to change the regulatory landscape and regulation is always sort of trying to play catch up with the new paradigms. Um, and in, in this case, you know, the problem is just that the um, the sort of like underlying societal basis of those regulatory paradigms is based on some things that aren't as applicable or don't, you know, are, are, are like intended to protect consumers, but um, can also actually cause harm to consumers in, in the context of the modern world. So for instance, you know, m most of this around securities law, um, like the kind of pillar of um, U.S. securities law uh, is um, the case law of a uh, Supreme Court case, um, which I believe is maybe from the, the 1920s called the Howey test, um, which was based on this like orange orchard. Um, and, you know, it, it has these four pillars and um, it's about groups of people coming together to uh, invest money in a common enterprise with an expectation of profit derived from the efforts of others. Um, you know, in a, a world a hundred years ago of like investing in an orange orchard, um, you know, the, the like basis for making that case law was just a completely different set of, of sort of underlying assumptions about how the world operates than the world we live in now. And um, I think what we've seen over the past century is that those sort of protections that were put in place to keep people from getting scammed are an important thing to have. And there obviously are a lot of scams in crypto. Um, but we also have these new tools that give people, you know, new forms of, of self-sovereignty of digital assets, which can be financial assets. They can also be governance assets, um, which, which I think is actually the more interesting and important version. Um, but the problem is all of these things, sort of regardless of their purposes, um, are being kind of lumped into this category of, of a regular regulatory structure from 100 years ago for an orange orchard. So yeah, I mean like a major uh, a major motivation for the for the regulation like as you say is um you know to prevent scams um like in in a in a world like without any kind of a central regulator like that like how is there is there like a like a down native idea or solution for dealing with things like scams? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think this is where Web3 actually starts to get really interesting. Um, like so much of the focus has been on highly financialized applications because that's the obvious lowest hanging fruit, um, you know, that like fits very natively with the idea of a public ledger and and fits very um, easily with, with people's sort of like personal motivations to make money. Um, but I think that the much more exciting and longer term impacts of Web3 um, have to do with, um, you know, developing better coordination mechanisms, governance structures, webs of trust, um, you know, uh, reputation systems, civil resistance, um, you know, the, these sort of things are uh, um, what get packaged uh, into an idea, I believe Glenn Well is coming on this series later, um, he coined it a term called um, decentralized society, um, which I think is basically a an expansion of the idea of something like decentralized finance to this broader set of reputation systems and, and web of trust systems that, um, you know, can can start to help us allow, can, can start to like build the primitives of um, allowing strangers on the internet to coordinate more effectively. Uh, obviously, like that doesn't stop, you know, someone today from like getting getting scammed because they don't know how to use a seed phrase or, or something like that. Uh, obviously, there are like, you know, big and real problems there. Um, but I think what's happening right now with some of the regulatory stuff, particularly after the last bull market, um, uh, is that we're we're kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater here. Um, and did you have a, a, a comment about Web2 and uh, crowdfunding? Sorry, I'm still laughing at the baby and the bathwater, <laughs> which is just what financial systems do 
all the time. Like we've never, we've never transitioned from one financial system to another without a bunch of babies being thrown out. Um, I'm like, can we do it now? Um, yeah, I was, I was just uh, mentioning that these regulatory, like nonsensical, very old fashioned regulatory blockers, um, you know, stop you from doing a bunch of things even without trying to do it in web three. Like we did our recent um, pre-seed round for Interinsel Act, partly crowdfunding because we want to allow community members to invest in Interinsel Act. And you, know, it's, you have to just like deal with this insane legal apparatus if you want to do it. You can of course go and, and choose a crowdfunding platform which has its own upsides and downsides. But you know, like, I don't know, when I started first fundraising, I was like, can I just tell people on Twitter that I'm fundraising because that's where all the people are. And my lawyer was like, no, we're taking Twitter away from you. You can't talk about this publicly because you can't advertise it. And I was like, oh, but I can DM people. And he was like, yeah. I was like, okay, so this makes no sense now. <laughs> like, this is like completely incompatible with the technology. Um, so just like a note. Um, so where I, where I see Web3 actually inventing the wheel, is not to be yet another problem where old-fashioned um, financial blockers uh, may play a part, but having potentially solutions through just like having a completely, completely different accountability and, and kind of screening system or method. Um, Kyla, you mentioned previously Wyoming DAOs. Um, can you go into some detail as, as to how that works? Um, well, I can't describe exactly how it works. I'm not that familiar with it, but basically Wyoming is a very progressive state in terms of crypto regulation. I think her name, oh gosh, it's, um, what is her name? The senator there, it's like Catherine or Katie or something, uh, but she's done a really good job at like advancing the narrative for crypto. And basically if you have a DAO, you can register it as an LLC in Wyoming. Um, I don't know, I think there's a couple of additional barriers in that process, but that's just one example of how, you know, the traditional regulatory landscape is allowing at least some aspects of crypto to, to engage in a, you know, a meaningful way. So that's kind of what's going on there. I can speak a little sense. more to that. Um, yeah, yeah, the cabin is, is actually a Wyoming entity. Um, we're not using the Wyoming Dow LLC law, uh, which maybe says something about the Wyoming Dow. Oh. Um, we're, we're a Wyoming UNA, an unincorporated nonprofit association, um, which I think is generally a more interesting structure for the type of Dow that we are, which you know resembles essentially like a neighborhood association, but also is just perhaps a more interesting structure for Dows in general because um, of the sort of constellation of smaller organization approach that I was describing. Um, I'm glad Wyoming's experimenting with this. I think one of the big advantages of a, a you know, federalist structure like the United States is that you get this sort of thing happening, right? You get different states trying different things. Um, but honestly, I think um, a lot of folks have been pretty disappointed with the actual implementation of the um, Wyoming Dow law because it, it does look a whole lot like an LLC with just like more rules attached to it. Um, whereas I think that like, you know, to, to Kyla's point earlier, like what we need here are more um, crypto native ways of, of thinking about things. And, and unfortunately, for the most part, you know, our current set of legislators in the United States are not like people who have or probably ever will go through the looking glass on that one. Do you think the Wyoming Dow laws are useful for any types of institutions or is it just too much of like a chimera that is still finding its feet? I personally have not, you know, I'm not a lawyer, obviously. I, I don't want to like, I'm sure, I, like, I'm glad they're experimenting with it. Um, uh, you know, I think that we, there's a couple other organizations operating in this sort of like new uh, city space. One of those is City Dow, and, and they, I believe, um, you know, used one of the first entities using the Wyoming Dow LLC um uh regulatory structure to buy a piece of land in Wyoming like that's the sort of stuff I'm really glad it's happening I'm glad people are exploring it um I just don't necessarily think that like trying to graft the word DAO onto LLC structures is gonna like necessarily result in the outcomes that that actually make sense in the long run are, are, are there are there other states that are experimenting with this or uh, other countries yeah, certainly. Um, you know, I mean, the 
So the most interesting thing about DAOs is that they um, do not need to derive um, their like sovereign execution capabilities from legal contracts. And so I think it is um, a, a bit of like a, um, you know, it, it's all, it's like a not even wrong approach. <laughs> it's like, it, I, yes, we need to find ways for, for these things to interface with existing legal structures, um, but they are an inherently different thing. Like the fact that um, I, I would recommend anybody interested in really diving into some of the details of this, look into Spencer Graham's anti-capture framework, um, which is a way of understanding, you know, how DAOs um, have like fundamentally different structures for the execution of collective action that, um, you know, like basically they, you, you don't need to have a contractual system at the core of it for it to work, which is kind of the first like time we've ever had something like that. And so what I think is more interesting about these UNAs and, you know, other, other structures is that they're very flexible. They can operate within the context of, um, you know, the, the myriad of ways that DAOs are implemented and the myriad of experiments that are happening within the context of, of DAO governance structures, while still allowing DAOs to interface with the real world via um, these sort of special purpose vehicle um, legal entities that, um, you know, are essentially like APIs for the rest of the world. Um, we'd also like to start inviting questions from the audience. I know everyone has thoughts uh, or questions also for like our special guests. Um, so yeah, please chime in. Feel free to use the raise your hand feature or post in the chat. Um, hmm. Someone is raising. Oh, hi, Paula. Hi. Yeah, um, thank you so much for two of you for four of you for joining this call. Um, super interesting. And I think something that I found uh, really interesting with DAOs and Web3 in general is this like concept of tying digital tokens to physical assets. And I guess you're doing some of that with Cabin. Although, am I understanding correctly that you're basically buying or like not buying, but you're getting like a pass for a co living sort of space? Or how does that exactly work, uh, John? Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, cabin long term goal building a network city. Um, you know, right now we're basically focused on helping people come together, co buy properties, and and turn them into um, opportunities for members of the cabin community to co live together. Um, and so that's exactly right. The the idea is basically that um, you can get a pass. Uh, we have cabin passports which allow you to access properties in the network and, and co-live in them. Um, and then crucially, each property is an independently owned, operated, and, and you know governed neighborhood within this broader network. And so there is a DAO governance layer um, you know, that's determining things like which places can and can't be a part of the network and how do we spend shared resources. Um, but it's also this sort of like um, you know, fractally federated model um, where all of the uh, people who are working as service providers to the DAO, all of the neighborhoods um, within the network are are also independent autonomous pods. And could you talk a bit more about like some of the challenges of tying physical properties to on-chain tokens? Um, like I'm thinking of an edge case maybe of like, what if, you know, your tokens are stolen? Like what happens in a situation like that? And like, what do you actually own in that case? Yeah, totally. Um, yeah. So this is a, a really wide open and interesting design space, which is why you're seeing people try a bunch of different things. Um, so, you know, one thing of note here is that particularly because um, the Howey test that I was just describing is about an orange orchard, it's it's about physical real estate. Um, you know, physical real estate is something you have to be particularly careful with when designing for regulatory structures. Um, and so, you know, we, we believe that the best way to get around that is to essentially make sure that the people involved in a local property are actually 
actively involved in it and are, are sort of stewarding and developing that property right now. Um, I, this is, I'm sitting in one of the cabins at Neighborhood Zero, which, which is a cabin property outside of Austin. Um, we have a, a crew here right now for a, a build week where we're actually building physical infrastructure. We're working on a new bathhouse right now. Um, and so those are people, you know, that's like a pretty clear example of something that, again, I'm not a lawyer, but like is not in my mind anything that could be considered a violation of, of the Howey test because um, it's not efforts of others. It's efforts of actual people directly involved in the thing. Um, and so that gives you a lot of flexibility to, to, you know, not have to worry about some of these issues so much um, in terms of like then the specific implementation, you know, so neighborhood zero is an LLC, but it's an LLC that actually has, um, you know, is connected to an on-chain entity for, for representation of um, ownership. Um, and, you know, in, in that case, like you can, you you could just do it as a traditional LLC and sort of track things with legal paperwork changes. You could have things point to um, you know an on-chain entity for for token ownership representation, um, and then of course you can also have more like crypto native um, structures where you know you literally could just have as we do for our service provider fellowships, multi-sig wallets, multi-signature wallets, which have you know multiple signers. Um, which are collectively responsible for a set of, of on-chain assets, which can also, you know, we're, we're kind of uh, <laughs> developing or, or working with people who are developing a lot of the tools for starting to be able to do things like spend money on debit cards directly out of a, you know, um, a multi-sig wallet or, or things like that, um, that allow us to create pathways with traditional legal structures, with sort of these like blended hybrid structures and with purely untrained structures for, for operating within real world environments. Cool, thank you. Yeah, I think that answers uh, most of my questions. I have a question. Um, I'd love to know how you guys think about generating engagement from within a DAO because I'm a member of a few, and one of the things that I love about them is that they're so distributed, like you end up interfacing with people from all over the world. Maybe you don't even know what the real name is. Um, it's just like a really cool way to bring people together. Um, but when you don't have that sort of IRL component, I think people tend to drift away and then getting engagement, especially around things like governance is really tricky. And a lot of DAOs seem to struggle with that. Um, I don't know if that's maybe easier when you have this sort of real world component like you do with Cabin or if there's something analogous that could be applied to a more distributed DAO, like how do you get people to participate in really important votes and pay attention to what's happening and be engaged? Um, Cause it seems that people show up with maybe a lot of intent when they join, but then they sort of drift away. And then the same core people are always the ones that are managing the day to day. Um, yeah, sure. I can, I can jump in here. Um, so, yeah, it's a great question, right? Like, the, the, we should start out by saying that, like, the corporate structure exists for a very good reason, um, which is that, like, humans are humans, and we've had a couple hundred years at least to sort of, like, create optimal structures for, for these sort of problems, right? And the corporate form is designed to solve for the sort of problems you're discussing, which is, like, everybody doesn't want to like vote on everything. What they want to do is have, you know, like as shareholders, you elect a board and then the board is responsible for hiring a CEO who then, you know, is responsible for building out this like centralized organization. That's not like a bad way of doing things. That name works pretty well. Um, it's important to understand the ways in which that works effectively and, and the ways, you know, the failure cases um, associated with it. I, I, um, wrote an essay about how decentralized organizations win and lose that, that I can drop in the chat in a minute. Um, but the the point here is that like that's actually a pretty good structure to deal with things like um, voter apathy. And if you look at traditional corporations, there's a, an incredible amount of shareholder apathy. Um, like turnout for shareholder votes is is basically negligible and rarely has any real impact on um, anything. Um, and that's even more true now that you know most people invest or a lot of people invest in index funds and, and things like that. Um, the, so in order to do something different with DAOs, you have to actually do something different. 
if you just set up a monolithic entity, um, you know, you're you're going to run into the same problems that corporations run into, um, like voter apathy, you know, and and sort of like centralized control, which again is not inherently a problem. But if you want to do something different, you got to try different things. So examples of different things include operating within these much smaller pod-based sort of organizations I've been talking about, right, where people have a higher degree of direct, um, you know, and this also ties in with the anti-capture idea, sort of like direct execution of financial coordination is a pretty high motivator for people to be more actively involved. Um, I would also recommend looking at JokeDAO um, and the Joke Race platform, uh, which is something David Phelps, uh, uh, an incredible Twitter shit poster and uh, thought leader, um, has been working on, um, which is essentially a shit poster to DAO pipeline. Exactly, that is very, very densely strong. populated with people. Yeah, yeah. His whole point is like you have to make governance a game. You have to make it fun. Um, and the way you make it fun is by making it a competition and not just having these like rubber stamped yes, no votes where you're essentially treating a broad set of token holders as a board of directors, because that's not what they want to be. What you do is you create these like multi-choice, you know, governance games where, where people can vote on a set of proposals and, um, you know, you, you, you do things that like actually create real stakes and real opportunities for people to have uh, sort of put their hive mind input into big decisions in, in ways that aren't haven't just been boiled down into a, a yes no rubber stamp. Yeah and Caleb you had a similar train of thought as Kristen did you want to chime in some more? Um, let's see if I had anything to add on top of that. Um, yeah, it, it was just like trying to figure out like what the early lessons at this point were um, from John or anyone else who's involved in DAOs and how to maintain that engagement. Who, I guess it sounds like that there's like this, like uh, you're using the 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 DAO or the blockchain to sort of like mobilize resources and like capture this sort of like flash mob, um, like uh, way of gathering people, but then you're transitioning into this these other forms of of governance and uh, that that are more traditional maybe and so um you know is it is it just that like the 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 web3 aspect is just this new attractor and it's allowing more people to sort of like find each other and and form these new experiments and it, and it's really just an excuse to just try new things um so i don't know if that was a question or just some thoughts so. I'm talking a whole lot, um, <laughs> so I will try to stop myself. Uh, but um, I, I do have a pretty clear response to that one, which is yes. I think the thing that um, that like tokenized social organizations are best at is exactly what you just said. Um, uh, and I'll drop another essay in the chat um, about the the memes of production and financial flash mobs and hyperstructures, um, which, which is exactly about this idea, which is basically that like DAOs are very good at turning memes into financial assets and then turning those financial assets into protocols uh, for governance. Kyla, did you have any thoughts you wanted to add to that, um, especially as you think about financial markets? And you, I, I think you've also mentioned that you're excited in like the potential for DAOs for collaborative investing um, and collective coordination in the financial space. Uh, would love to hear if you have anything to share on that. Yeah, no, I mean, I think everything that um, I could address, or uh, Jonathan knows a lot more than I do about this mm -hmm. subject, um, because he's building something, right, and I'm not doing that, and just obviously it's like a ton of knowledge. Um, in terms of like how I think about financial markets and DAOs, um, I've been talking to a lot of like asset managers recently about, because, you know, everybody's very interested in institutional adoption of crypto, so it's a little bit different than, um, you know, DAOs per se, but they're very much like, are our stocks going to become DAOs? Uh, like that's a question that I get a lot where it's like, what is the future of, of a corporation? So I think there's a lot of interest in like having DAOs be a little bit more part of the narrative, but to the question of like coordination, I think that's just a very big issue in general. Like how do you get people to engage and, and in general, it's a very tough uh, decision. But yeah, I think like um, attach, like attaching ownership to things is, is a great first step. 
um, and uh, enabling people to, to be a part of something bigger than themselves. Like, I think what's really cool about DAOs is like the concept of fractionalization. So like I could never buy a Van Gogh art piece. So it's so expensive, but like through a DAO, you can do something like that. So it allows for collective ownership of assets too, um, in terms of like real estate, the NFT house, I guess that's not really a DAO, but like, that's just one example. The Constitution. Of how, uh, the Constitution. Yeah, yeah. I, I do remember that, yeah. Um, so like there are those times where you may get a community together and you can do something. Unfortunately, uh, you know, Ken Griffin got in the way there, but yeah, so there's a lot of cool stuff that's happening, yeah. Do you think it's relatively easy for people to get in, uh, involved with these initiatives or are there, do you see like a lot of barriers to entry? So for me, like I think the UX of crypto and like Web3, it's just not very engaging at times. Like it's a little confusing. You oftentimes have to have a wallet and it's like very, like if you were to show your grandma like how to do certain things, she'd be very confused and she'd be not very happy with you. So that's kind of how I think about user entry to most things is like, is, can my grandma do it? And I, I don't think so, but like that's a lot of different things. Like traditional finance falls into that same category where it's very confusing to open up accounts. So I think like, the user accessibility is a key issue and then also just general knowledge and the culture around crypto which unfortunately gets conflated with DAOs in general like a lot of people see crypto as like not not a good thing now, right uh so i think that's also a big barrier is how people perceive it um so that was kind of like a convoluted answer to your question but yeah um on the uh on on the grandma point um okay. there was a uh a great um, interview recently between Devin Zugel and Russ Roberts. This is on Econ Talk, where she's yeah. talking about uh, she's talking about a piece that she wrote recently on uh, crypto in Argentina um, and the uh, uh, and the effects of hyperinflation. And um, uh, so, you know, I guess one of the major causes of of um, uh, of hyperinflation in Argentina is is just just that the government will sort of through the bank account system essentially print print money. Um, and, um, and so, uh, she has this story where, uh, she was uh, speaking with like, you know, her fiance's grandmother or something and, um, uh, like about crypto and the grandmother was like, oh, wait, it's a place where I can, um, I can put money and the government can't get it. It's like, sign me up. <laughs> like, how do I do this? So maybe it's the, uh, the whole like UX thing is, is really in part, um, uh, like a question of motivation too, right? Yeah, you, this is the thing with crypto is that you are your own bank and that cuts both ways, right? It's like this magical superpower of, of self-sovereignty. And it means like you have to deal with the complexity of being your own bank. And that stuff's getting easier and it's going to keep getting easier over time. But like, you know, there, <laughs> there's a reason banks exist and it's because like managing, you know, financial infrastructure is actually a, a pretty complex thing. Um, and so DAOs are probably like the most extreme example of that because they are the um, layer where you're not just trying to do like single player mode asset management for yourself. You're trying to do multiplayer financial coordination. And those are some like incredibly hard technical problems that, you know, I think um, uh, the DAO space has not invested enough in in solving for the user experience of um but uh you know once you sort of like make it through that rabbit hole it unlocks some pretty magical capabilities uh, that i think are actually highly accessible by by the nature of their transparency yeah this um this might be uh taking us a little bit off the rails but i i um in in the us um uh like a, a long time ago, we didn't have a central currency, right? And and I would expect probably uh, most countries um, evolve in this way in which there are banks that, that can issue their own currency or local currencies, and then eventually get the entire system gets uh, consolidated into, um, you know, there's some, some something that looks like a central bank or like a Fed. Um, I'm curious, uh, you know, there seems to have been maybe a natural evolution towards that sort of centralization. And here we're looking at the kind of technology that we can we can now go the other right way around. Um, I'm curious if if uh, if Kyla, you or John have have any thoughts on how this progression might take place. Um, like, is this going to be like a sort of a um, uh, like a gradual evolution here, like towards decentralization, or is it going to be something much more sudden and dramatic? Uh, I 
I, I can go first, I guess. Um, and I wanted to apologize because I feel like I'm being very negative, but like my mindset has just been negative around the work that I've been doing recently. So really sorry about the, uh, if I if I'm coming across that way. Very excited about crypto and Web three and DAOs in general. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of like decentralization being adopted, like once again, <laughs> I think it's a regulatory issue. Um, I think that the United States has a very big incentive to not have um, you know a bunch of nation states popping up within the United States. So I think that's a big concern for them. Um, but I also think like there's a lot of room and a lot of opportunity to like rethink how we have currency because right now the US dollar is essentially a wrecking ball on emerging markets because it's gotten so strong because of what the Federal Reserve is doing. Um, so I think there's a lot of room to rethink how our systems work in that regard. I think there's a lot of value to having a little bit more um, separation of, of power, but that gets into the whole thing like we're a globalized society, we all rely on each other. I might not be answering your question um, the right way, but I think that's one of the issues is just the regulatory framework. And then we do live in you know a society that's globalized. So. Um, yeah, one, one, one kind of striking thing about, um, you know, about this, uh, uh, this um, uh, case of Argentina is, is just how much people um, seem to be willing to, in the open, work around the official, uh, you know, like the official state apparatus. In the U.S., like that, that kind of willingness, I think, is is not really there. But I, I I'm curious if, if, if just, just like in general, like in emerging markets, it's like especially there is just more of a willingness to, uh, to not, not, um, not have to uh, do what the regulators say. So I think this question of like decentralization progress um, is maybe not the framework that. Well, sir, I I have a different framework that I I like to use here, which is um, uh, you know, there's this great Jim Barksdale quote um that like the only two ways to make money are bundling and unbundling, um, and uh, I I think the like another uh, sort of extension or or a, a related analogy to that is that like the only two ways technology progresses are are like centralization and decentralization and it's really cyclical um and so i i don't think you know i i think you can talk in like broad strokes about the ways in which technologies are creating modes of centralization and decentralization um uh, and, and that's a pretty ripe area for exploration. But, um, you know, I think what, one way to think about that is that, um, you know, like a lot of the, you know, uh, AI technologies, particularly as they're being used by China and other pretty centralized structures are like causing, um, you know, a high degree of, of like centralized power and control. Whereas, um, you know, Web3 is like giving us a new toolkit that can allow for these more um, decentralized or federated structures. But, you know, even then you sort of have to like consider these things um, through the lens of cycles because, you know, Web2 was also like all about you know, democratizing information and, um, you know, is supposed to be this big like force of decentralization. And I think we've seen how that's played out over the past decade. Um, and so, you know, I think you just have to sort of assume that these things operate in cycles and you, you can't um, get too caught up in thinking that like, you know, this is some like permanent new wave of decentralization or something. Um, should we um, uh, see if there are any questions from the audience? Yeah, because one of our goals is to make sure that everyone feels more knowledgeable and empowered about both old governance and new governance, or if anyone's hoping to get more engaged with uh, DAOs and newer forms of governance structures that they can have the tools for that. Um, but yes, we will take questions. Um, and Rohit, I think you have your hand up and then Caleb. Hey guys, um, so I just want to preface my question saying I'm very, very new to this entire space. Um, about 90% of what I know about DAOs and Web3, I learned in the last few hours, uh, you know, with the reading material for the salon. One of the articles I did read was uh, the one that Anna shared, um, the one by Lee Jin. And one the thing that's out. Oh yeah, the, the, the John Rawls speed. Oh yeah, that's a really good one. Yeah. So one of the things that stood out for me was the part about the difference principles where um, DAOs offer the ability to incorporate 
initiatives that benefit the disadvantaged. So to sort of offset any sort of, you know, uh, runoffs like <clears throat> rich people continuing to get richer. I'm I'm just wondering how uh, that I didn't understand that completely. What does that look like? What do these self-correcting systems actually look like? Um, so <laughs> I don't have a whole lot of information on that. Like I, in Jonathan, may have thoughts. I do think that's actually a problem, and I might not be understanding your question. So are you saying like there's these whales that will gather up all the tokens, and then there's a, like a self-correcting mechanism in the DAOs to prevent that from happening? Is that what you're sort of? Saying? Uh, what? Okay. Uh, uh, no, it's probably. I, I think I might. Yeah, you might no, understand it. Yeah. I might understand what you're what okay. you're going for here. Mm -hmm. And and Kyla, I think actually I was doing a little, you know, just research on on some of your stuff before uh, we we jumped on the call here. And and I think you actually in a, um, a deck or a blog post I was looking at talked explicitly about this problem in in terms of like the um you know here's all the problems with like modern governance and finance and here's how Web three is going to solve them. And the one that you, you just had like question marks was this one, which is like, how how do we actually solve this question of like, um, you know, better distribution of resources? Um, and, and this is like one of the fundamental questions of economics. If you look at, at like, you know, Adam Smith, um, like invisible hand type stuff, he like, it's a very elegant solution with a big caveat that he's like, I'm not going to try to answer the question of how you actually distribute the money at the start of the system. I'm just going to say that it's efficient after that. Um, and so I, I think that um, the theory here for how, you know, crypto takes a stab at this, and I say theory because I think in practice, we've seen that, um, you know, there's still a lot of, um, of like, power law distributions of, of assets uh, in, in Web3. So it's not like this is a solved problem. But one way to think about this solution here is um, that, you know, more, more sophisticated forms of airdrops um, are essentially trying to solve that like original distribution mechanism that's at the core of the un, unanswered Adam Smith question. Um, and one way to solve those is to say that, okay, we're not just going to distribute ownership ownership or governance or whatever to um, people who pr provided financial capital into the system, we're also going to distribute ownership and governance to people who provided labor and who just participated as users in the system. So for instance, um, SAFE, uh, rebranded from Gnosis SAFE, which is the core uh, multi-signature wallet on Ethereum that DAOs use um, to govern assets collectively, uh, recently did an airdrop of the SAFE token, which is a governance token for governance the safe protocol they airdrop those tokens to um you know people who had actually used the product based on you know their, their on-chain transactions um as an airdrop and this type of mechanism is is pretty common for um large DAOs as, as a method of distributing ownership more broadly to participants in the system uh in that case my follow-up question would be who decides to do these airdrops yeah, great question. Um, so, so yeah, there's a concept, there's a great uh, essay called Progressive Decentralization by um, Jesse Walden. No, no system or structure can like effectively operate fully decentralized out of the gate. Um, uh, a good friend and, and um, cabin contributor named Rafa Fernandez, who's also a, uh, you know, um, I guess part of the Twitter shit post to Dow contributor pipeline. Um, he, he once said something I really liked, which was a DAO is an organization in the process of becoming a DAO. Um, and there's something very elegant about that because, um, you know, DAO at this point, at least uh, is a primarily um, like aspirational thing that organizations want to be. There are very few things that I think could legitimately claim that they're a DAO in the kind of original uh, Vitalik definition of, of DAOs and, and other forms of decentralized organizations. Um, but so, so what that means is that like who does the airdrop? Typically a more centralized entity that is trying to progressively decentralize. Um, and then Caleb, I think you had a question on lists. Anyone? Yeah, I think it kind of ties in with this a bit in some way. And it's, I was basically just thinking about, um, again, back to like, um, 
long-term persistence and how to sustain the organizational values of these systems over time and like do blockchains actually provide new technologies for how to prevent this re-centralization from occurring or is really where this is all ends up playing out is in the cultural and social layers uh, of the dynamics and like is you know is that still you know part of the the, co the complexity of of this so Yes, I, I think like the inherent nature of blockchains um, encourages decentralization, right? Like that's what it's designed for. But and not to sound like a broken record, but I really do think like regulation and whether or not regulation catches up to that nature of what is actually like the ethos of the space. Um, so that does sort of tie into like the cultural, social aspect of it. Like I think in order for like Web3 crypto to really become like what it can really be, like it has to be properly regulated or it has to sort of um, be in places where they don't have to worry about regulation. Uh, so I think that's like the, the big issue in my mind is like that everything is in place for it to be decentralized and good, but uh, yeah, culturally, socially, it's, there's some barriers. So decentralization is a, a like multi-dimensional design space. Um, and I think that's both a good thing and a, a bad thing. People tend to think of it as sort of this like one thing and there's actually like in order for a system to be decentralized, it typically has to be decentralized on a lot of different axes. Um, you know, so for instance, just take a, an L1 blockchain like Ethereum. Um, what does decentralization mean for Ethereum? Well, it means um, a distributed set of uh, the underlying asset of the chain. Um, it means a wide set of you know, different um, software for running uh, nodes and, and validators. Um, you know, it means a bunch of different people um, who are, are not in any way related to each other actually operating those nodes. Um, you know, it mean, and, and it means lots of other things too. It means like a, you know, governance process for how changes to the underlying protocol get made. Um, and like the, the hard thing about decentralization is that, um, centralization at any one component of the system becomes a weak link that undermines the decentralization of the entire system. Um, and so you have to think of this like multi-dimensional set of spectra um, that can all be operating as more or less decentralized. Um, and as a result of that, you know, you, it's actually, it's like very challenging to maintain like a fully decentralized system um, in, in any meaningful sense. And also not to mention that even decentralized looking systems have fully centralized parts still. I, I copied in this really good and much discussed piece by Moxie um, where he just kind of explained to me like I'm five way, went into uh, to the creation of NFTs and actually located a bunch of apps that work fully web too. Um, so there's also a, that added level of complexity. Right, or, or not necessarily fully web too, but certainly have centralized bottlenecks, right? So a lot of that Moxie piece is about the ways in which um, the underlying infrastructure of the MetaMask wallet in Fura um, sort of serves as this centralized database for um, for many other blockchain apps where it's like too cumbersome to directly query the blockchain to understand um, sort of higher level data abstractions. And so people have created these more centralized um, systems for, for uh, expressing those abstractions in an easily queryable way. Um, but then if you just look at those abstractions and you're not actually looking at the blockchain, oh, now all of a sudden, um, you know, you, you've basically like gotten rid of the underlying decentralization. So th this is the sort of thing that makes things like proof of stake, you know, in the transition that Ethereum just made, just like these incredible technological advances that are almost like unbelievable um, because they just have to think about how to maintain the de decentralization across so many possible vectors. Um, Anna, I, I think you have your hand up and then Paula. Yeah, I just thought I would raise my hand because I have a follow-up mm -hmm. question. Um, I'm wondering, and this is a question to uh, both kind of and John here coming from two different angles and meeting in the middle here. Um, do we have outsized expectations toward Web3? 
and how fast we should be progressing. Because now that you were mentioning, like, of course, like, yeah, there are these Web2 bottlenecks in some Web3 systems. This reminds me of like, I have a really good developer friend who like learned Fortran because he found out that in London, sometimes things are like insurance companies and banks break. And then the developer who knows no JS comes in and like opens the box, looks inside and it's like Fortran or something else in the fifties. Um, and so if you learn one of these archaic languages, you will make a lot of money because there are like two people who can help Lloyd's bank and they have the budget <laughs> and you say whatever number you want. Um, but this also means that, you know, all these sedimentary layers are always there when we move from technology to, to another. Do we expect Web3 to do this more quickly and leave behind? Are we over-promising? Um, it seems to be that a little bit yes, right? Like, oh, Web3 just like kind of burst on the scene. Um, and we expect things to happen in two years that otherwise take like a, a technical generation to fully, fully like complete the uh, the transfer. Uh, what are the thoughts on that? Of course, like the fundraising landscape doesn't help because you have to fundraise saying like, this is all new. Yeah, like you over promise. I think there's a great, uh, I, I want to say maybe a Bill Gates quote here, um, but I, I think it's an idea other people have represented it as well of um, the sort of way in which um, uh, something growing on an exponential is worse than um, sort of something growing um, linearly for the first period of time. Uh, and then only after, you know, it reaches an inflection point, does it, does it sort of cross over the, the linear growth and um, the relationship between these two curves causes humans to underestimate what can happen in a decade and overestimate what can happen in a year. Um, and so I think like self-driving cars are, are probably the clearest example of this over the past decade where, you know, a decade ago, there was just like so much hype when Google started putting out the first videos of, you know, that cute little like self-driving car experiment they were doing, um, you know, and then it was like, then you go through the trough of despair, right? And everybody's like, oh, this is never going to work. And here we are a decade later, and there's like legit self-driving cars operating on the streets of San Francisco. Um, and I think that's like a, a pretty typical pattern that you should expect to see with Web3 over the next decade. Um, Paula. Yes, and also just realized I've been mispronouncing trough as tro my whole life. So thank you, John, for that. Um, but the question I had was around specifically like governance. And I think like the appeal of DAOs is that they're sort of like controlled by or governed by individuals that vote and, and make decisions. Um, but I know that there are cases where like more established institutions like VCs will sort of invest in, in a DAO. Um, and I just want, I wanted to ask if you know from like personal experience, like how they then interact within these DAOs. Um, and also what are your thoughts on VCs being part of DAOs in, in general? Um, I can go first, I guess. Uh, so I, I think um, VCs have partaken in, like I believe Friends with Benefits is one example of a DAO that has, I think A16Z is in there, um, and I imagine there are in a couple other DAOs. Uh, you know, in terms of my views on VCs being a part of that, like funding is super important and they're a big source of funding. I think what would be really interesting is, is you start seeing like other private investment groups like private equity and hedge funds um, getting into the DAO space, but there's a whole like regulatory issue with that. Sorry to say that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think like from a funding perspective, it's good. Um, do they contribute? I'd imagine not. So yeah. John, do you have yeah. Um, Cabin completed a, um, and we've actually completed two treasury diversifications that included some, some strategic partners. Um, and so it's something I've thought a lot about, um, you know, obviously like the, like Kyla has been saying a lot, the regulatory stuff is complicated and it gets particularly complicated in this area. Um, and so that's the real challenge in terms of like, is it a good idea to have people who like have really strong networks and pools of capital that are contributing those capital that that capital into more democratic structures that then can be you know collectively governed by a community 
I don't know, that sounds pretty great to me. Um, and obviously you have to be, you know, careful with, with how you structure those things. Um, but like, yeah, I think that's, that's a much bigger, like net positive for the world than probably a lot of web three and crypto people give it credit for. Um, and actually some of the best and most, uh, like functional DAOs that I'm a part of, are investment DAOs. Um, I think that like investing is actually a very uh, DAO native behavior. So, for instance, I advise Seed Club Ventures, um, which is a you know a fund made up of LPs from primarily other VC funds, um, and it's a really good structure for having you know like pretty low transaction cost coordination mechanisms for bringing in a really wide sense-making network of venture capitalists to make capital allocation decisions. What do you think about capital? The book? <laughs> yes. John, what do you think about this company? <laughs> and then we will ask Tyler. This is like, all of this is like a covered operation to find out what but it's like, about like core market. Capital as a concept? <laughs> they're like, <laughs> discuss Marx and then Gorky we will go up <laughs> no I'm sorry capital the 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 new bank for startups oh right 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 capital yeah capital. yeah they just rebranded and they I, have a you marketing have campaign. perspective here uh they're not a DAO yeah um so like what are you asking I just saw that it's happening and my friends are giving interviews for them. So I was wondering what you guys think about it. It has a crypto element built in because I, I would imagine that the idea is that if you will be running startups in the future, then some of your fundraising will be via crypto. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I have a couple of friends that work there. I didn't know they had crypto online. Uh, that's cool. Um, I, I think it's just a different way for startups to um, raise money. I think their main goal is to become like the bank or like the one-stop shop for everything. So yeah, it seems, it seems to be a cool way to do it. Yeah, I think we're going to see a lot of these sort of like my understanding, I'm not very close to that specific example, um, but my, my understanding of what's happening here um, is uh, basically that like anybody who's ever worked on a startup or try, you know, done angel investing or anything like that knows that um, cap table management is this like incredibly annoying complicated yeah exactly Anna it's and just like super expensive right yeah, yeah like, it's like, like it's like ten like ten thousand dollars a year or something up to it's just to like get an ex get a pimped up sorry excel sheet right exactly and then literally you have like an excel sheet that represents who owns what and anybody could just like fat finger a typo on that. It's not like no one can see, you know, the the ledger. There's no transparency. Um, you know, th this is like this is what blockchains are good for. Um, and so I think what we'll see, and I actually now, so I I angel invest, and I now, with very few exceptions, like will not angel invest if it requires like sending a wire transfer and uh, like, you know, doing traditional safe paperwork because it just is a worse method of doing things. If you're gonna manage a cap table and if you're gonna raise money, um, like having crypto native mechanisms for doing that is just such an obvious win for everyone involved in terms of lowering transaction costs and spending less time talking to lawyers. And I see this as being something that can actually like, you know, an un, probably an unchronicled uh, aspect of like fraud reduction in crypto is that it will just kind of deter people who want to mess with you. Because you're like, yeah, well, you'll be put through the blockchain. <laughs> like you can argue with it. And if, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that, you know, this is a uh, common in, in, in the West, but for instance, if you talk to founders in some countries where, you know, maybe like the financial ethics are less exemplary, this is a huge issue for startups um that a lot of these you know um american um british ways of ensuring fairness are not there or so much is based on like being friends and like referrals um so i think there's there's also this deterrence of, um deterrence effect there that will change the norms to the better yeah i think that's a problem not in terms of like like 
the framework of fight. Like I think everything is fine financially in terms of regulatory, whatever, um, like things get done. But I also think there's a lot of discrimination in VC. Like you saw, like there are statistics published that, you know, not a lot of funding goes to people of color. And so I feel like the decentralization aspect of this too, um, in some of the, like the more anonymous aspects, like will really help get rid of these, you know, pattern matching biases that people tend to carry to with funding, which would be really good. Um, Sam, I think you had a question or a comment. Um, did you want to come up or uh, should we read your question out? Yeah, um, like I noticed John was describing like what sounded like fundraising uh, for Kevin as treasury diversification. Uh, and I think it, it, it felt to me like it ran with a lot of the questions we had earlier today, like uh, questions about like, progressive decentralization, etc. So, but before I put words in John's mouth, I thought like, uh, Love to hear like a bit more like like what was thought about it like using that particular phrase and what was it thinking behind that what problems was that trying to solve? Yeah, that's a good question, um, and it's a very nuanced area. So I will once again add the disclaimer: I'm not a lawyer um, and I'm not a financial advisor, uh, and, and so um, you know we're all just out here trying to navigate in a very uncertain regulatory environment. Um, what what that means to me is that you know like i was describing right one thing that um distributed ledgers are very good for is this sort of um tracking of ownership uh and tracking of governance rights um the sort of things that have traditionally required um you know a lot of contractual paperwork and that sort of thing um so we we approached um cabins treasury diverse so in order to like you know, pay contributors um, and and service providers to the DAO, we need stable assets because ultimately those people need to like pay their rent and buy food and stuff. Um, and so a core problem that DAOs face is this problem of treasury diversification. If you have a DAO, primarily what that DAO is initially holding is typically your native token. And that native token is either like in our case, a totally illiquid governance token, you know, or in other cases has a lot of volat volatility associated with it. So you, you, the term treasury diversification refers to the process of finding strategic partners who will swap, you know, your native token for a stable asset so that you can use that stable asset as part of um, your contribution mechanisms uh, or your payment mechanisms for contributors. Um, so that that's a process we've gone through a couple of times at Cabin. Um, and the way that we've approached that is to say that the token is our only governance mechanism. And, um, you know, we don't, we, we, when we did those, um, you know, essentially token swaps as part of the treasury diversifications, we did not have any, you know, traditional safe documents um, or, or other, you know, sort of like financing documents that gave uh, special rights to, you know, these strategic partners or anything like that. And a traditional startup, typically if a, v a VC is giving you money, they have all sorts of contractual rights where they get special terms and, you know, they get liquidation preferences and all this stuff. Um, and we're a community. And so our kind of base rules here, are everybody operates under the same rules. Everyone gets the same governance tokens with the same rules. Um, and then, you know, everybody is expected to be an active contributor to the community. Um, and so in our case, what that means is that we brought in strategic partners who were able to help us with that treasury diversification process, but who also actually show up on, you know, our community calls and who help provide value to the community and to the organization. Um, and by doing that, we, we would view, um, you know, the, the um, act of a treasury diversification as being substantially different from a traditional fundraising process. Um, on the topic of fundraising, I think Bradley Miles is here. Um, we'd love to hear your uh, thoughts on fundraising with tokens, if you're able to talk. Um, if not, like, uh, feel free to chime in later. Um, um, John, John, I, I, I do have kind of a, a kind of a trollish question. Um, what, what happens if, um, uh, if a bad actor buys up, um, a majority of cabin tokens, like somebody who is not contributing to the community? Yeah, they can't. Um, 
so we, well, first of all, the DAO still holds a majority of the token supply. Um, oh, I see. Uh, but then e even beyond that, um, it's a it's not a liquid token. So this is something that that differentiates mm -hmm. Cabin from a lot of DAOs out there. Is we've been very intentional about um, you know distributing our our token to active participants in the community. Um, and not having any like pathways for speculation on our token. Um, and see. so there's not currently a liquidity pool where somebody could go, you know, buy up tokens. Um, and then even if they did, we have some other mechanisms in place. So for instance, um, you know, on the, on the kind of point about multidimensional um, decentralization, one of the forms of decentralization that we use is quadratic voting which is something that Glenwell uh, also can talk at length about and I, I believe actually invented. Um, he has a great book about it called Radical Markets. Um, and the idea behind quadratic voting is that your vote power decays quadratically. Um, you know, so uh, for instance, I'm one of the larger holders of cabin tokens, but rather than getting way more say than everyone else, I get a little bit more say than everyone else um, because uh, even though I have you know a substantial number of tokens, those tokens decay in power the more I use them. Um, and so that's a sort of like decentralization mechanism that uh, encourages a widespread distribution of tokens and also um, limits the power of, of people buying up tokens. Though so the question around like um, governance attacks is a really good one. There's a great Vitalik essay, which I'll pull up. Uh, Vitalik Buterin, founder of Ethereum, is pretty anti Coinbase voting for this reason, uh, because he actually specifically lays out the attack mechanisms that people could use um, via buying or or even renting tokens for governance. Mm -hmm. votes. Right. Yeah. And do you, do you have a mechanism for uh, if if a, if an existing token ho holder um, stops being an active contributor to the community? Is there some kind of a mechanism for taking that person out? Yep. Uh, so I'm dropping the link in on uh, Vitalik on coin governance, which is a classic. Um, on the question of um, sort of like governance power versus contribution over time, there's another like big meme in crypto um, that draws its origins from Bitcoin which, and now Ethereum in, in a post-merge world. Um, this idea of like, um, you know, essentially a deflationary supply or, or a fixed supply being an important component of, of token economics. Um, I disagree with that. Um, I, I believe that inflation um, can be a good and important part of, of building economic systems, um, uh, which is like shockingly uh, kind of out there idea in parts of crypto. Um, and one of the main reasons why I believe in inflationary mechanisms is specifically to to deal with this question, right? So you you there's no way on a blockchain to like take away an asset from people once you've given it to them. That's kind of the whole point of, of self-sovereignty of, of assets. But what you can do is you can decrease their um, power power in a governance system, for instance, over time by uh, some combination of creating more tokens and um, airdropping those tokens to people who are actively participating in governance, which is what Kamen has done. So if you're an active governance participant, um, you, you have, when we did, uh, you know, our, our sort of like minting of, of our new token, um, we provided like a multiple on that token to people who had been actively participating in governance in order to increase their um, say. And I think there'll be like increasingly interesting mechanisms for this sort of like, uh, you know, um, distributing power to people who have been helpful in making positive decisions for the organization over time. Mm -hmm. um, Kristen, I think you had a question. Yeah, um, I'm wondering if any of you have thoughts on pseudonymity, because I think it's really interesting to me. Um, I I know people who I've spoken to for hours. I have no idea what their real name is or where they are, anything about them. Um, and it's a value that's that many people in the Web3 ecosystem hold. It's pretty cool because I think it provides a lot of opportunities, maybe for people who um, just want to contribute and they don't have to worry about anyone perceiving what they look like, where they come from, who they are, anything like that. You can just be judged on maybe the merits of your contributions or how you interact. Um, at the same time, like I think when you start to interact with the real world, the financial and legal systems, that gets complicated. So is it realistic to think that pseudonymity can be um, a thing that people blame for or, or um, that they can operate under in 
this ecosystem or is that maybe too idealistic? Um, I can sort of talk about this, I think, but um, yeah, I think um, the, the issue with this is the KYC, so know your customer sort of things like that could go against, I think, the element of, I always say it wrong, suedo yeah, the word you said, and I think that's like the biggest barrier, but ideally, I think in the tech world, you do see people still being able to like be anonymous to a certain extent. So because we do have this online universe, I do think like elements of that will be protected versus if everything was IRL. Um, but I do think depending on how things go, like there, some of that could be taken away, but I don't think it's something that will have to be hundred percent taken away. Yeah. yeah. Plus one, I think the regulatory stuff around KYC is, is probably going to be the biggest forcing function for limiting the um, ability for pseudonymous uh, people to operate. Um, but it's also one of the big unlocks of like fully on-chain systems and um, yeah, I have a number of friends now, uh, folks like uh, Flex and Commodore of, of Krauss House and um, Tracheopteryx of Coordinate, um, you know, and, and Meta Dreamer of Metafactory, who, who like are people who I just know by their pseudonymous names. And that seems like it's an increasingly common thing in the part of the world that I operate in. Um, I just have like lots of friends now who I just know by internet handles. And that feels now like a very normal and and reasonable thing to me. Yeah, you could imagine maybe something like a government blue check mark for KYC, where where the government knows who's behind some particular uh, address, but nobody else does, right? I don't know if anyone is like actually working on such a system, but it, you know, it seems like it's technically it's possible. Yeah, Balaji has defined some uh, basic primitives for like bits of anonymity as a method for transferring um, pseudonymous reputation. That stuff's pretty interesting. Um, you know, I think like uh, I, I can't go deep down the zero knowledge proof rabbit hole, but there's some pretty interesting stuff happening right now in ZK world um, that may create these sort of opportunities you just described where there can be like a, um, a way to verify that somebody has certain reputation or, or you know, th things without actually knowing exactly what those things are, which is like the, the real future wild magic beans of, of, uh, of crypto land right now. And I think something that we might need eventually, because I think Balaji is, uh, is an investor in Interinteract and his big, you know, comment always is that this is too unanonymous for him. Uh, but on the other hand, our product has its own needs and, and the reason why we can provide as a service excellent conversations on the internet. One of the reasons for that is that these are like you come with your own face and your own name and, you know, there's a zero incentive to, you know, for trollish behavior during an intern sex salon because, you know, we know who you are, you will probably be removed and you will never come to a meeting. Like, you know, it's like there's no, there's no win. Um, and, and for us, you know, creating, for instance, or making our entire forum anonymous would raise a lot of, like, it would create problems because, okay, then the salons are with real names, but the forum is like, but, but if there was some kind of Hegelian synthesis there, that might be something that, uh, that works for us. Um, like would, you, hey. would you, John and Kyla, would you have come to an intern text on a special guest uh, if we didn't know anybody here? There would be no faces. It would be like a really weird clubhouse experience. It would be a different vibe, no? Yeah, as much as I've been talking about the positive components of pseudonymity, like, uh, you know, I, I mostly like hanging out with internet people in high bandwidth reality um, and in systems in which I have some sort of confirmed, uh, you know, values and vibe check associated with them. Um, I think a lot of the decentralized society stuff we started talking about at the beginning of call with like web of trust and civil resistance and, um, you know, reputation. And you said that going outside is web five. Yeah. Like you go outside. Web four. Web yeah. Yeah. Web, web four, five yeah. is the thing Jack Dorsey's doing, <laughs> but yeah, it, go, going outside and touching grass with real humans is, is still going to be my preferred method of, of interaction. And that does require a certain amount of embodied, uh, realism. <laughs>
So we're almost approaching time. Um, JP, I think you had a question. Yeah, um, I'm wondering, John, about the uh, evolution of cabin as an idea that transformed uh, itself into reality, like through the work of you. And uh, was it like an idea that you had always and you saw in Web3 the means for transforming it into a reality in a more uh, pure way related to the idea? And uh, yeah, in that sense, like how the, how has that view evolved after uh, the process on which you started working with it as a DAO and where you are at related to like this journey of, okay, this Web3 thing is a solution for what I want to bring into the world. Is it still strong in yourself or it has lowered the strength? How do you see that? Yeah, um, there's a whole, whole lot to dive in there for uh, like one minute left. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to be concise. But I think for me, you know, I felt very um, fortunate and grateful to get to work on a, a project that um, feels like it pulls together a lot of strands of things I've been interested in and thinking about for a long time. Web3 and DAOs is, is certainly one of those. And I think that, you know, like I said, the sort of basic primitives of Web3 around um, um, culture, economy, and, and governance are also the same primitives around cities. And so it, it seemed like a natural fit. Um, but it's always much easier looking backwards than looking forwards. And so, um, you know, if you're really curious about this, there is a rabbit hole of some of my old writing you, you could dive into. Um, I think I first started writing about the idea of decentralized cities, um, you know, as I was building the first cabin um, and as I was thinking a lot about my time at Instacart working in, in the context of more centralized marketplace structures and, and labor economies. Um, and uh, only, you know, through the process of, of um, building the actual physical cabins and the community around them, did we come around to the idea of starting to experiment with some of these Web3 primitives originally in the context of a creator residency program, which is the origin story of the DAO itself. Um, and then, of course, the DAO took on a life of its own and, and grew from there. Um, and I think there is very deep resonance between a lot of the, you know, ideas we were exploring before we were a DAO and the, the tools that, you know, are, are available, uh, particularly for governance for DAOs. Um, but I think it's something that we are continuing to, you know, uh, explore and evolve over time. And it's, um, easy to dream big in, in bull markets and easy to like get disillusioned in bear markets. Um, I, I don't feel disillusioned, but I certainly do feel like, um, the people who are still left building in the space are trying to create this sort of synthesis that allows for us to tap into the benefits of small, more centralized coordination groups within the context of these larger decentralized structures. Yeah, so we're going to close, uh, but I have one more question for Kyla. So as you'd mentioned that you felt kind of disillusioned with some of this space as part of your recent work. And we're curious if like you've changed your mind about anything during um, this event. Um, and we'd also love to hear a bit more about what you've been working on and what you're working on next. Uh, yeah, sure. No, um, not necessarily disillusioned, just like frustrated, I think is probably the better word. And I'll, I'll talk quickly. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think like just the regulatory landscape sucks. <laughs> like in regulated, like Gary Gensler, like the way that he's handling it, it's uh, frustrating. Like he's suing companies in order to, to regulate them properly. And I just don't think that's efficient. It's not an efficient use of resources. Um, so I think that's just the frustrating part of it. Uh, and then in terms of like what I'm working on, <laughs> Um, I'm all over the place right now. Yeah, I have a newsletter, a YouTube channel where I, I talk about more stuff that I am doing, but very deep in macroecon land right now. So yeah, it's resting. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Kyla, John, and everyone else who's uh, joined us uh, this morning or evening, wherever you're at. Uh, we'll be running these on the third Saturday of each month. Uh, next month, we've got Alex Tabarrok talking about crypto economics. And then in December, we've got Glenn Wild talking about decentralized society and pluralism um, on Web3. And we're running this for a year, so lots to come. If there's a topic that you don't think we've touched on, please reach out to Wes and me or Anna, um, and we will try our very best to host a discussion. So thank you, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your weekend.
Bye.